good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to welcome you to our um, October installment of our BME Edge uh, professional uh, speaker series. Um, uh, for those of you who are uh, not as familiar with us, Edge stands for Extramural Development and Graduate Education. And so there are sort of two areas where we uh, uh, are involved to provide opportunities for you to get uh, diverse experience as you develop your careers. Uh, so the first of these is um, uh, through internships. And uh, Peter here is one of our directors. He'd be happy to say a few words. About that. Hey, hey guys, I'm just here to um, one give you guys a reminder about the Edge internship program, and uh, kind of just remind you guys about that our deadline for uh, basically applying to the program is the end of this month, October 31st. Um, so please, if you guys are intending to apply, email us, let us know, and please start the conversation with your advisor to get the MOU signed and submitted to us by that deadline uh, to give you guys priority over the different internship opportunities that they come. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, uh, so that's one of the uh, ways that we get involved to help you uh, prepare for your careers. Uh, the second is through these uh, speaker events. Uh, basically, we like to provide people that uh, have diverse experience, uh, who have Hopkins connections, uh, who can come in and uh, uh, say, uh, you know, what kind of fascinating careers they've been able to have because of their education in graduate school. Um, uh, so in this vein, uh, I'm one of the directors of professional development. My name is Robert. Uh, the other one is Mike, uh, sitting in the back there. And uh, we're especially pleased to have uh, uh, Captain Rob Newman here uh, today. Uh, so Rob is a, um, has a bachelor's in biology from the uh, U.S. Air Force Academy. Uh, he also has an MBA from the University of Baltimore and a master's in clinical engineering uh, from our very uh, BME department. Uh, right now, Rob is uh, vice president of regulatory affairs for Apical Instruments, which is a uh, medical device company that uh, specializes in minimally invasive uh, surgery technologies. Uh, prior to that, uh, he has uh, extensive experience and working with startups you know, in areas as diverse as robotics and in imaging. Uh, he was, uh, also has extensive experience with GE as an engineer and as a manager. Uh, and uh, he was actually a fighter pilot instructor for the U uh, U.S. Air Force as well. Um, so with that said, I think I'll hand everything over to um, Mr. Newman. Uh, he has a really interesting talk prepared. Um, as I said, he has plenty of diverse experience. So uh, ask questions early, ask questions often. Right. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, I do have, as I said, I, I am a graduate from the program here. A um, long time ago, 83. Uh, and I went to the University of Baltimore at the same time. I got an MBA and a master's in engineering in the same two and a half year period. Um, there was no program like this at all. In, when I was here, it was all about, you know, Eric Young and mathematical modeling and the nervous system, and you do all this, and then you got the endless semester and said, oh, by the way, this actually happens in humans. So it was very science-oriented, and there was not a lot of clinical part, but I spent a lot of time, I got very interested in imaging while I was here, and I spent a lot of time in the radiology department, uh, learned about uh, ultrasound imaging and x-ray. My master's thesis was in uh, image quality and digital subtraction and geography, which was kind of the hot setup at the time for doing cardiac work. And I uh, graduated and went to uh, GE, and they said, yeah, we'd love to hire you in the x-ray group. Uh, we have this new project starting called Magnetic Resonance Imaging. Um, would you like to work there? And I said, I don't know anything about it. And they said, neither does anybody else. And I said, that's exactly the job I want. So I was employee number 25 in the GEMR business, and when I left in 2000, we sold a billion dollars worth of MR that year. So it was a pretty, uh, pretty exciting trajectory through there. And since I'll talk about uh, some other things I've done, but I've been in a bunch of startups. So my other connection with here, other than going to school here, was uh, I met a young guy a long time ago. Uh, he was a um, wee sprout and just working and getting his PhD. Uh, he was a Canadian, uh, working in Toronto, and ended up doing a lot of work with, uh, he and I did a lot of work together in the early days of MR, and uh, he now sits on the third floor above here, so Elliot McVeigh and I uh, go back a long time, and also I met uh, Yusef Yazdi when he was at J&J, &J. so we've kind of run into each other professionally and personally along the way, and it's nice to be back here. So I'm just going to, I have a few slides, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff I've done, Please ask questions, and this is, my life is not interesting enough that you need to listen to my whole biography, but this is just to kind of stimulate some uh, thoughts and ideas. 
So, um, you know, I've had a very linear career path. Is absolutely is meant as a joke because uh, I started out on a dairy farm in Michigan, and I was sure I was going to be a veterinarian, and that was my uh, that was my goal. Except uh, I got ready to go to school, and uh, I didn't have any money, so I went to the Air Force Academy. Um, you just you have to give up 11 years of your life, but it's a you know small price to pay to get off a dairy farm. It's just you do what you have to do. Right? Um, I wanted to still want to be a veterinarian, but the Air Force needed pilots at the time because the Vietnam War was on. I'm that old, um, and so uh, I flew fighters for a while, and uh, then came back here. I, I really missed medicine, so I came back here and uh, got a BMA degree, and as I said, went to Hopkins and uh, was joined the engineering group at, uh, I was in the systems engineers group at Hopkins, and I got very interested in applications development. So spending time in Hopkins and Stanford and all those other non-Hopkins places around the world um, in new product development. And uh, in 2000, uh, we had some technology, we had a uh, surgery technology uh, that GE didn't want to commercialize. Jack Welch didn't want to be in the therapy business, said absolutely, we're not going to do this. So we spun it off as a standalone joint venture with an Israeli company, and I went with the JV and, uh, in 2000, and I've been with startups since then. So some of the things I've worked on, uh, this is a you know, conventional diagnostic <coughs> MR. I'm sure you, you know, probably lots of you have had them for knees and shoulders and cervical spines and whatever. Um, in uh, about 95, we came up with this idea of an MR system that didn't need liquid helium. So we were doing high temperature superconducting, 10 degrees Kelvin instead of 3 degrees Kelvin. Um, in, in the superconducting world, 10 degrees is high temperature. Um, so anyway, we, we in, came up with this MR system where the, operate, the imaging volume was right here. And so we put together a system so that it could be used in the operating room for primarily neurosurgery and spine. So you could do real-time MR and touch the patient at the same time. Uh, we built a bunch of prototypes. That's a whole another lecture on what we did with that. Uh, very cool. Didn't go anywhere. Uh, eventually, the program ran out of money and we shut it down. Um, this was the focused ultrasound company uh, making uh, the idea of projecting ultrasound energy. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, I also worked for a company, uh, Catheter Robotics, with a uh, a robot that manipulates catheters inside the heart for uh, RF ablations. And then uh, another company was something called uh, Oxygen, um, that imaging embryos for uh, how, how do you pick the best embryo for in vitro fertilization. So, worked on a lot of different kinds of things. <coughs> to me, medical, you know, medical technology development is really, my life has really been running around these three points of a triangle. You know, and so up here are the engineering guys, you know, we've got this great idea, we've got a solution in search of a problem. You know. Over here you got people with problems. You know, I I need a less invasive, I need a faster responsive, I need something that works on fat patients and skinny patients, I need something I can do telemedicine. And then over here is all these people of, you know, can I sell this? Would anybody pay any money for this? Will insurance companies reimburse us and should they reimburse us? You know, what's the effect? Is this more effective than current, you know, than the current treatment? And so, in in the process, you know, I've really learned to speak engineering and doctor and marketing, and that's really you really have to solve all three of those problems if you're gonna if you're gonna build a, a new technology. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, thermal therapy as kind of a, a case study, one of the things I worked on. So, thermal ablation, the idea of heating tissue up to about 85 degrees centigrade so you can coagulate it, very well understood. It's been around since, you know, Euclid and, you know, you, you burn out a tumor using, you know, all kinds of things. You can use cryotherapy to freeze it, you can use laser, hot water. Uh, the whole idea of focused ultrasound is in diagnostic ultrasound you take a flat transducer and you project the ultrasound energy into the body, it bounces back and you make a picture kind of like radar. With focused ultrasound you use a curved transducer and you focus the energy on a single point, kind of like a magnifying glass focused on the sun, where all along the trajectory, it's, it's not, there's no heat, it's only where all the beams come together. And so we can heat up a hot spot about the size of a jelly bean in 10 seconds inside the body. 
So thermal surgery is a very accepted tool. Uh, the problem was visualization for placement. You know, I could put a laser fiber in something and I can deliver the energy at depth. The problem is I don't have any way to see where I'm going. So maybe I have to use stereotactic, a stereotactic frame from a CT I took yesterday or a week ago. But that's okay for here, but it doesn't work very good for here. Because if I roll over on my right side, my liver's in a very different place than if I roll over on my left side. And also, how do I control the dose? So in a dead piece of meat, I can tell you exactly how many a 40 watt delivery is gonna make a one centimeter lesion. But if I put it in the liver and I'm right next to the portal vein, or I'm right next to the surface, or I'm right next to an air-filled sinus or something, 40 watts may give you, you know, two millimeters. Or it may give you one millimeter in this direction and 15 millimeters in that direction on the other side. I have a question. Uh, how sure. is this uh, ablation <laughs> surgery performed? Is it uh, laparoscopy? With focused ultrasound, what we did, different, is we combined it with MR. Because we came up with an MR but we did it with real-time MR, so we made the transducer, we put it inside the MR machine. So I could use the MR to, just, to identify the treatment volume, and then we used real-time MR to measure the temperature. So I could, every three seconds I could make a full image where I could measure with a one degree centigrade the temperature of every pixel in the, in the image. So you could, you, I mean, it just looks like, you know, it looks like water flowing out of a hose. So Fuchs ultrasound was a better knife. You know, it was non-invasive. I could treat an arbitrary volume. You know, laser fiber can treat a cherry, or it can treat a hot dog. You know, if you have a long transducer, but you can't treat something square or something, you know, odd shaped. And very few things in in you know real anatomy are cherry shaped, um, other than cherries. Um, MR, at, but MR provided the ability to view in real time the anatomy and get thermal feedback. So I can see dosimetry. I can stop treating when I reach 85 degrees centigrade. So, inside tech, yes sir? Yeah, what's the cost benefit? Because you're using MRI, it's not cheap, right? Uh, but the alternative is open surgery. Okay. So you're, what you're trying is non-invasive. What we're trying to do is do things, for example, in this case we'll talk about, for uterine fibroids, we're treating uterine fibroids, the alternative was a hysterectomy. So the patient, you take the uterus out. I have a benign tumor of the uterus. You know, I have a something the size of a tangerine inside the uterus. It's not going to kill you, but it's very uncomfortable, bleeds a lot, and you can't get pregnant. And so, well, I can solve that. I'll just give you this directly. We can make that bleeding and pain go away, but it's really tough on your reproductive opportunities. So the whole idea, the, the application that we went with here is treating a benign tumor. So. <coughs> I don't take out your brain when you have a brain tumor. Why do we take out your uterus when you have a benign tumor of that? So this was an alternative to hysterectomy. So Insight Tech was the company. It came from two pretty good parents. So in GE we had, you know, uh, at the time, GE was kind of the best in the world in MRI. And there was this company in Israel called Diasonics Vingmed that was a cardiac ultrasound company and they knew everything in the world about making transducers for ultrasound. And so we kind of put these two things together. Um, GE, uh, Insight Tech gave GE $4 million, and GE gave Insight Tech um, a bunch of IP. We had about four systems and me. <laughs> they gave $4 million for everything else. I just came along because it was fun. So, um, so kind of, you know, to me, kind of looking at what I've done, so to me, it's been very logical. You know, I started out as a systems engineer. Um, you know, we have this new technology, and um, in about 1993, uh, we got into this idea. GE built a, uh, we came up with this idea that we could make an MRI machine that was not the conventional tube that you go down that makes all the noise. Oh, anybody had an MR? You know, all the noise? They don't make noise anymore. They, they figured out finally how to make the noise. It's com almost completely silent. Um, big development. Cost about as much to make the noise go away as it did to make the noise in the first place. <laughs> it's a whole other lecture on how you make the noise go away. Um, anyway, we came up with this idea of uh, the interoperative MR. GE didn't want to commercialize it inside. So, 
four of us went over in the corner here, convinced GE. Uh, we said, okay, we're going to go outside the company and we're going to raise money to build this little business inside of GE. So we went over in the corner and we raised $36 million from outside. We got Stanford to give us $3 million and Hito, uh, um, Japan and University of Zurich and some people, a couple of groups in Germany and a group in London <coughs> to give us $3 million and we built these prototypes. But we did it all inside GE. So it still said GE on my business card, but all the money came from outside. I actually have a question. Uh, what was the process uh, to solicit the money uh, for this? We showed them something that nobody else in the world could do. We, we, we brought them to Schenectady, and we had a working model of that. And we brought radiologists from all over the world, radiologists and neurosurgeons, and let them stand in the gap where I'm standing right there. <laughs> and somebody was laying there and making a picture of a patient with your finger stuck in her belly button. And a lot of people looked back and went, holy crap, I can think of about 100 things I could do if I had real-time imaging. So just a demonstration was that powerful? We, we, had, we had one of these and one of these. And we said, if you like this, we'll, we're going to, we're soliciting uh, basically shares, uh, we invited, invited people to invest $3 million in a little consortium that we had, and we said, we're going to build prototypes of this and this, and if you want one, you have to put $3 million in. And it was a pretty interesting project. So folks felt their sound. Here's a little timeline of what kind of what it takes. So, 1991, two smart guys took a walk together in Budapest. And one guy said to the other, this is a true story, one guy said to the other, um, started to describe this idea of projecting ultrasound and creating a hotspot and how they control it with MR. And uh, a couple years later, and a million dollars, we built the first prototype. Um, there were some other people, the University of Arizona, and a couple other people who were working with us. And we did our first patient in 1995. We did a breast fiber adenoma in 1995. Um, so Jack Welch said, I don't want to be in the therapy business. You've got to get rid of this. Shut it down, make it go away, stop treating patients, just can't. Put it in the shredder. And we said, no, we're not going to do that. We believe in this. And so we spun it off as a standalone joint venture. We found these guys in Israel. So we took the technology and the IP and went off in the corner. Uh, we hired a bunch of engineers, we made some more prototypes, uh, found a CRO, a clinical research organization. So it's a bunch of people to help you manage clinical trials. Uh, we got some regulatory law help and biostatisticians and all this kind of stuff. Um, got up to a burn rate of about a million dollars a month and started talking to the FDA about clinical trials. And installed the systems, wrote up a stack of data that's about that tall and as a PMA and submitted it to FDA. So that was in, in 1998, they spun us off, and in 2003 we finished the clinical trial. Yes, sir? So you said that you're up to a million dollars a month. Was that still off of the 36 million you originally raised? No, that was at, we, burnt, we ate the whole 36 million when we were still in GE. So <coughs> and we were down to zero. And so we started over again. When we went to Insight Tech, we went through a, a separate money raise. Yeah. So it took us about $55 million to get to 500 patients. So just a little side-by-side -side comparison, I think it's kind of interesting, of, you know, my life at GE and my life in startups. So, you know, in GE, 10,000 people in 30 countries, and that was just GE Medical. Um, startup, you know, more of a sailboat. We had 30 people in two countries, and I was the one in the U.S. I was in Dallas in a conference room about this big, and I sat there for a day or so, and then I said, okay, I need a phone. I have to get a phone. And I said, okay, I probably should have a computer. And so that's the life of a startup. Uh, GE Medical at the time had $9 billion in sales. We had essentially zero. Um, GE, there is no budget planning number less than $100,000. You cannot change the label on the software program for less than $100,000. And of course, you know, this is, you know, are we going to buy lunch for ourselves? GE organization, highly bureaucratic, highly specialized. Um, 
inside a, inside a startup, especially an Israeli startup, highly chaotic. You know, you can change your, when you're a startup, you have no product, you have no customers, you have no legacy systems, and so you can change your mind every day. Um, full line, you've got to have CT and X-ray and ultrasound and MR and nuclear medicine and PET, and here you've got a single product. GE, you can survive a crummy manager, a bad year, customer comes up with something else. Here, you get one 9 millimeter hole below the water line in your boat and you're done. You know, you're just, you're going to sink them. That's it. Um, product development, uh, we're spending about $250 million a year inside GE in our new product development cycle. This is in 1999. Uh, it's a lot more now. Um, we were spending about $10 million a year in new product development. Um, this was very fixed cycle, you know, in March you set your plan, in June you pitch it, in October you fix the budget for the next year, and in January you start with, you know, the budget planning. And here, you know, it's driven by the crisis at the moment, you know, what we're going to do. This is a big one, the market. You come out with a new MRI machine, I already know who I'm going to sell it to. They've already, you know, I'm going to sell it to the people I've already sold an MR2, or that Siemens has sold an MR2 or something. Here, you may have a product that nobody's ever seen before. You have to convince them, why the hell do I need this? You know, why, why is this, why is this an unmet need? I don't understand. I don't even understand the need, let alone it's unmet. I've never heard of this before. Um, regulatory, uh, five, uh, MR was a 510K at the time. Um, and so we're doing essentially consumer preference testing. You know, you go take some pictures, ask doctors, do you like this one better than that one? And that's what you came out with. Here, uh, focused ultrasound, uh, it crossed radio, uh, surgery and radiology at FDA, so you're dealing with two groups at FDA. There was a PMA, and so a PMA is for high-risk devices or for stuff that's so weird we don't know what the hell it is. And so you have to do a very large complex trial, you have to collect a lot of data. We had to go to a panel, so FDA wants to share the risk, so they bring in a bunch of doctors, and you have to do a whole presentation to a room about five times the size and all these guys sit around and at the end of the day they all get the vote whether you live or die. Hmm. Competition, something you got to think about. Uh, this is very well known. We know we're fighting Siemens and Toshiba and Philips and Shimatsu. If you, have a, if you have a disruptive technology, sometimes you're fighting everybody. There is no competition. You're fighting everybody. Focused ultrasound was a great example. Clinically, patients loved it because I can treat your uterine fibroid and at 3 o'clock this afternoon, I'm just going gonna, gonna to give you like two gin and tonics. You're going to lay inside this MRI machine for two and a half hours. And then you're going to go home and have dinner with your husband. And then you're going to go to work the next day and you're not going to bleed anymore. You're done. We've treated you. The patient said, that's good. I like it. Can I have a baby? He said, no, not yet. I don't have a baby yet. But um, maybe, maybe later. Just tell me you're not going to have a baby. I'm not going to have a baby. Okay. I know you're lying to me, but just tell me that. So, but how did how did how do you suppose GYM surgeons that do hysterectomies for a living? How do you think they felt about this non-invasive surgery that you go home in three hours? Think they liked it? They did not like it. They said, "Well, this thing is dangerous. You know, nobody knows what it's like. It could cause cancer. You know, you need to get that. You need to get that uterus out of there. That's a that's a bad one." Yeah. Did hospitals like it? Hospitals didn't like it. I gotta spend a million dollars on this system. I already know what to do. If I have a patient come in with severe menstrual bleeding or infertility and she has fibroids, <coughs> we're gonna schedule you for a hysterectomy. You're gonna come in two days later, you're gonna be discharged two days after that, and you're gonna go home. Have a nice rest of your life. No more menstrual bleeding. Did insurance companies like this? Insurance companies hated this. Because what are they what's the insurance company do? You have severe menstrual bleeding. We've been treating you for all this. We scheduled for your hysterectomy. You go to the hospital. You have your ears taken out. You're home two days later. You're never going to have menstrual bleeding. You're never going to get pregnant. You're never going to have endometriosis. You're never going to have cervical cancer. This is great. In fact, the insurance company, if they could, would take your uterus out at you know birth. <laughs> it's a very troublesome organ. Has all kinds of problems. Soaks <coughs> up a lot of money. And so the insurance company didn't like this idea at all. 
So you're fighting, sometimes when you're in a disruptive technology, you're fighting all kinds of people you never thought you had to fight. Now, is it your job to convince all of them? Absolutely, because if you don't, where are you? That's the difference. Solving these problems is the difference in between a science project and a medical device that makes a difference. If, if you don't, you do all this great stuff, you do this great science, you make this great, you know, your diabetes or surgery or whatever it is that you're doing, except the insurance company says no and there's no reimbursement. Well, you have a few people who might pay for it out of their own pocket, but the hospital says, I'm not gonna spend a million dollars to install a device in my hospital where there's no reimbursement. That's nuts. And the doctor says, I'm not gonna spend three hours doing a surgery on a patient that I'm not gonna get paid for. And the patient says, I really wanna get treated. I love this idea. Well, if you wanna come up with $5,000 out of your own pocket, we'll think about it, or we'll refer you to a center that has one of these. But, so you have to, you know, you have to slay all these dragons. You can't just defeat the laws of physics and engineering and mathematics to succeed. Sorry, I just have a question. I'm sure. just doing the argument to convince them all the police and doctors the patient wants to the hospital. Well, what you do in, that, in this particular case is you go over here and you get a whole bunch of patients that like their uterus. And you get, a, you get patient advocacy groups to push for it and you get them to jump up and down and make a case for it. But I'll tell you, in 2004, we got a PMA in 2004, it still doesn't have reimbursement. So the insurance companies have been able to hold out for 10 years. So the only patients that are getting that are the ones that are such amazing pains to their insurance company that the insurance company will pay for it or they pay, it off, pay for it out of their own pocket. Yes, sir. Thank God, I'm not a US citizen. In Europe, insurance is much easier. So do you have the same problems, or it's easier to sell these kind of things to Europe and these kind of emerging markets? Where the insurance company doesn't play a big role. No, but the state does. And so yeah. you have to talk the state into this. Yes. And so you have to, and like in Germany, there is five different regional insurance companies. There, there are essentially state insurance companies. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you have to go to Westphalia and do it there, and then you have to go to Bavaria and do it there. So uh, every country has a different model, and uh, so it, 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 it can be easier. And so what then you have to do is, you, when, when you're really thinking about reimbursement, you can't just, it's another part of you can't just do the science and stop. You have to come with the economic argument. Is it really better, is there, is there a public health benefit to doing this new procedure. You know, and you have to, and so if you just went and collected the data on, you know, did I get all the tumor out or did I do something, but you don't have any argument for the public health benefit, the people in Europe go, don't care. You know, you, England has this thing called NICE, the NICE, it's the, anyway, it, it's a clinical effectiveness group, and they decide, so you, you go do your whole thing, you bring it to the UK, you bring any new technology to the UK, and NICE has to look at that they're not NICE, but that's how they pronounce it. Um, you, you go there, and if, but if they don't say, okay, then you got nothing. You can sell it to anybody that will pay you for it, but there's no reimbursement from the government for it. So, uh, sure. Could you share us a little bit uh, of your experience when you get your first customer? How did you get it? Ah! Oh my god, somebody paid for this! <coughs> that was my reaction. No, no, it's not your reaction. How did you get it, like, get them sign a contract or whatever? Well, what we did uh -huh. in the beginning is you, you have to give away the first ones. You, first of all, in the U.S., you can't charge somebody for an investigational device. Okay. I can't sell the first one. So, I built this. Um, and this cost, the inventory value, I'm building the first one, this is a picture of folks, this is the bed that you lay on, this is the transducer, and it's on a little robotic arm. So it cost us about, uh, that's about $300,000 worth of hardware, and you have to give them away to get somebody to play. Um, you can't, what you do is, uh, once it starts to look a little better, you say, okay, um, to get you to play, I'm going to give this to you, and if we go commercial, 
I'm going to let you buy the first one for 50% off. Okay. So, so you'll be able to keep this. I'm pretty close to the end of my clinical trial, and so if FDA approves this, I'll sell you this unit. I'm, I'm giving it to you on consignment, and then once FDA, you're agreeing that once FDA approves this device, you're going to pay me half the commercial cost of this, and so that I can get some money back. Otherwise, it's just a total loss. Do you also collect the clinical trial data? Using this kind of oh yeah, yeah. That's how we go get the clinical trial data. Is you put them in the sites, and but it, it's total cost. I have to pay for. It. I have to come to Hopkins, Harvard, UCSF. Doesn't make any difference. I have to come here, and I have to get a clinical trial agreement. Mm -hmm. We have to argue about the IP. We have to argue about the indemnity. What if anybody gets hurt? Who's paid for it? Then I have to bring the unit in here and work with the clinical engineering people to get them to approve it. And then I have to get the IRB to approve the clinical trial, and I have to pay the clinical coordinator, the patient, the, the nurse who's going to work with me to collect the data, and I have to pay the PI to come to my investigator meeting, and then I have to pay the CRO to have the people come out here and monitor the study, and then I've got to pay somebody in my company to come here and teach the doctor how to do it, and then for the first uterine fibroid treatments, I was at, we were at every one of the first 150 treatments. And so we were flying all around like crazy people. Um, I, I lived with a bag in the back of my car for two years. Uh, you know, you get a call at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and they say, we're doing a uterine fibroid at Hopkins at 7 a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay, see you there. And so, you know, I would land out at BWI at 1030 at night and, you know, be up on the sixth floor in radiology at 6 in the morning. How many people were involved in your startup at that point? There were about uh, 10 or 12 of us in the U.S. and about 20 people in Europe. I'm sorry, just one follow-up. Sure, sure. So how much does it cost for you to do these kind of negotiation with the hospital and how long does it take you? Um, for this kind of people? A lot and forever. Um, <laughs> some hospitals are very much easier you know, to deal with than others. Uh, some of the hospitals that are located near here are very hard to deal with like the hardest in the whole world. Um, we're trying to fix that. We're trying to improve that. But um, it, it totally depends. I mean, some some hospitals are really into this, and I want to be first, you know. And, um, and it's very complicated. When you're building a study, you really, you know, for whatever, you're really looking at all, somebody asked me a question earlier. They said, how do you, how do you decide who's going to be on your clinical trial? Well, you, it depends on what it is. So you have to look at, where is this disease rampant? You know, where is there a lot of incidence of this disease? I need a hospital with a real champion. I need a doctor who really believes in this. Somebody goes, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, we could do that here. Get in your car and go to the next town. You know, don't you don't need a lukewarm investigator because it costs just as much for a guy who doesn't care as it does somebody who does care. Then you have to find uh, a IRB that likes this idea. <coughs> then you have to get the tech transfer people. To and the, the general counsel to sign a research agreement with you. And you, when you build a clinical study, you want to populate it in general. You populate, you need to populate your study with two kinds of doctors. Dr. Big Name, which is, you know, he's the chairman of the American College of Cardiology. He's the keynote speaker at RSNA. You know, he's the, he's the journal editor for the Journal of you know, Oncology or whatever it is. Because you want, to, you, want, you want him to at least be neutral. You want him to know who you are, because you don't want your paper, you do your study, you get your, your paper is coming up for you know, submission, and they look at it and they go, oh no, they're doing that at, they're doing that at Harvard. That's junk science. You know, we're not going to do that. We need, you know, if this is anything important, it's got to come through me. And so you have to think about that. You know, who, who are you going to have? And so you have Dr. Big Name. Dr. Big Name may or may not be a PI. Or he may be a PI, but he's so busy and so important, and he's got six complete competing trials that he never puts a patient on your study. You go through all this pain and suffering, but you get no patients out of him, but at least you get him on your study. And then the other kind of guy that you really want is you want Dr. Dozalot. Dr. Dozalot is at you know, Anne Arundel General, and he does 25 RF ablations a week. He doesn't travel all over the world giving talks. He's just been in the community for the last 20 years. He has great results. He sees all of the patients himself, and he's, and he's getting really good clinical results. And he follows up the patients in his office. You know, I, 
you know, I have a study where I need follow-up every 90 days for a year on my patients. Never do it at Mayo Clinic. Fabulous institution. Love to do clinical studies at Mayo, but if you're going to need that follow-up, what happens at Mayo Clinic every November? 30% of their patients go to Florida. <laughs> you know, they, you, especially if it's in, a, in an elderly population, they'll go to Florida or Arizona or Texas or someplace. And so how are you going to do your follow-up every 90 days? And if you can't follow up your patients and you don't get the data, they're lost to follow-up and they're, they're lost to follow-up to the FDA. I guess they didn't come back because they died. You know, so you have to think about where, how are you going to get your patients you know, you always get to the end of the study and you've sized the patients and you, you're going to end up, I need 85 patients to make my endpoint. 85 successful patients out of 100 to make my endpoint. I've got 83. I can't find these last two patients. I finally tracked down the patients. She's a very happy patient. She got married and she and her boyfriend moved to Australia. It was really happy. I paid for her to fly back from Australia to come to the last visit because I had to have her in my study. You know, we finally got a hold of her, found her, the, the nurse who was at the hospital, who was friends with her, knew her mother, didn't know where she was, knew her mother, called her mother, her mother said, I'll call her, and I'll have her call you, and we paid for her to fly back from Australia to be able to finish up the last visit on the study, or else we weren't going to make our end point. So here's what it looks like, so here's the transducer, you project the hot spot inside the body, here's a, a willing patient, and um, that's, that's that ring right there. Um, what's the, how, say, what's the, like how different can you focus the focal point? Like, so if you have different size patients. You can project, at that time, we could project up to 10 centimeters deep, and we can make a spot um, as small as four by four and as big as 10 by 15 millimeters. And then what you did is you just made a whole bunch of jelly beans. You basically, you, you outline the tumor, you outline the tumor, and you basically figure out how many jelly beans are in the jar. So how many jelly beans do I have to stack up to completely ablate this volume? <clears throat> so, kind of the different stages. So, product developer was when I was, you know, a regular, you know, engineer at GE. You know, you're part of a big team. Um, the good news is, predictable steady work. You know what you're going to do, you've got a budget, things are going to go on. The bad news is predictable steady work. You know, if you've got a wife, a kid, big school mortgage, uh, predictable steady work is a good thing. And if you learn, get to work on cool stuff and, you know, get to hang around with good people. You know, I, I loved working at GE. GE was big in training. I got to go all over the world. Fantastic company. So kind of an entrepreneur um, you know, take some of the lessons learned and go in kind of a new direction. Maybe you can make a new thing. Um, good news is maybe you're exploring a whole new market, interoperative imaging in the operating room. Um, you're competing with the status quo, you know, you're fighting with, for attention in other groups. Um, entrepreneur, you go out on your own. Break out completely, 100% of my eggs are in the same basket. You know, if you've got a one-trick pony, that's great. Until your pony gets sick. Um, so maybe a home run. Uh, sometimes being a prophet out there in the world can be very lonely, sometimes fatal. So kind of final thoughts. Um, if you're thinking about this, uh, think about the whole business, the whole thing, not just the science of what you're doing, not just the, you know, how do I make this work? How do I measure this blood sugar? How do I, you know, suture this, you know, the gallbladder? Think of the whole business case all the way through to the end. You know, just building a better mousetrap does not guarantee success. Um, decide the necessary core competency. What do I really have to be good at? And what can I buy? You know, what talent can I rent from outside? Do I really need a biostatistician in my company? Probably not, because I need a guy up front for about you know, a few weeks to help me scope my study and figure out what's my clinical trial, how many patients do I need, and then I need one at the end to help mash all my data. But I don't want to pay him a bill. Software engineer, this is a very software intensive device. This is a very, I need a materials guy. I need somebody who understands everything about plastics or permeable membranes or whatever. That's the kind of person I gotta own. I gotta have that person inside. 
pick your partners well. You're going to spend a lot of more time than you with your spouse. Try to avoid getting an asshole for a boss. But that's hard because usually those are the guys in the, uh, with the money. Um, know what you don't know. Go out and get help. Don't read the rule book about FDA and decide, okay, I've learned the rules. You know, that's like reading, you know, I, I buy a book on how to play football and get out there and play with the Dallas Cowboys and the Baltimore Ravens. You know, you're going to get squished. So go out, hire the people, know what you don't know, be good at what you're good at, go get help for the other stuff. Make it your passion. Don't, don't jump into something that you don't want to give your heart and soul for. Because you're going to give your heart and soul for it and, it, and it just you'll be bitter. So, uh, you know, if something was really easy, somebody else would have already done it. Um, and Maury Blumenfeld, I worked for, for, I worked with him for 25 years. Um, you know, his quote is, well, the most important ingredients for success is lack of foresight. You know, if, if I knew then what I know now, if I knew how hard this was going to be, I never would have tried it. So, a lot of times you get to the end and you succeed, but it took a lot more than you thought. So, um, I just really like these two quotes. Uh, you know, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. That's, that's what you do when you do this. Um, anybody know who Ernest Shackleton is? Should go, go look up who Ernest Shackleton was. Very interesting guy, he's an Englishman, uh, exploring the Antarctic. This is a true ad that he put in the paper looking for people to go to the Antarctic with him. You know, hazardous journey, small wages, return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. So that's, you know, that's what you're looking at if you're going to a startup. But, um, I'm going to, uh, I'm part of the culture committee, and uh, so I'm going to be active in some of the projects here as a consultant. There's a large group of Hopkins grads in the Bay Area that is trying to find a way to get involved. And so Elliot and uh, Yusuf and I are working on how we can do that to kind of be consultants to you guys. On, you know, if you have a regulatory question, I can help you with that. If you have a question on permeable membranes, find something else. I can't, I can't do that. But. Um, but there's a lot of folks out there with a lot of background, done, done a bunch of startups, done a bunch of technology, and uh, we want to get involved to uh, help make you successful or help you find out what it is you want to do or just as important find out what you don't want to do. Anyway, that's my story. stay in academics or these internships should we try and look towards entering with a startup or an internship with GE or what do you think would be the most helpful at this stage? Well, the good news is you have a choice because in the bad old days when I was here, you know, you were highly incentivized to avoid the stench of commercialism totally. Being a Hopkins man, you know, you could, you know, you were supposed to be pure science, you know, stay away from all that kind of stuff. Now, I, I think this is fantastic. There's a program like this, and for some people, being a PhD and doing peer research is nirvana, it's what they want to do. For me personally, I'd rather stick pins in my eyes. You know, I like to go out and build stuff and stand beside a patient and see if it works. That's what I like to do. Um, and both of them are, you know, meaningful things to do with your life. Um, get, do an internship. There's a lot of companies that do internships. Find somebody, go out and try it, because you may go out for, you know, three months and you know, you make a little money or you don't. Um, but uh, you may go out and say, wow, this is great. I would love to be in this, you know, this chaotic, you know, fermenting environment doing all this crazy stuff. Or, oh my God, this chaotic fermenting environment makes me nuts. I couldn't stand the idea that, you know, you know, in 60 days, we're out of money. You know, we've, we've got a hit in 60 days or we're out of money. And all, you know, gotta go home and tell your wife that. Some people find that very exciting in a good way, and some people find it very exciting in a bad way. Um, so internships are great. I really, uh, we've, we've done them regularly. We did them in GE, and we've, we've had them in, uh, in our company. Uh, you know, you just gotta find somebody that, that's a good match for you. Um, I would not, you know, it's great to go to a startup. The problem is, in, if you're a really super specialist in something, and that really 
is if, and you're in the make versus buy, you're in the buy part of the make versus buy for the startup, go do it. If you're just a generalist, go and go to a startup. I would go to GE or Medtronic or somebody, spend a couple of years, learn what you know, find out what really turns you on, and get some skills so that you can go to a startup. Because startups are all about being a generalist. You've got to be really good at a couple things, you personally have to be really good at a couple things, and then you have to know something about everything else. Because today is we're meeting the venture capitalists, tomorrow is the health department is coming, the next day is we got to fly to St. Louis to go to Sinclair to the animal lab and do a contract down there, you know, with, a, with an animal lab. So um, leaping into a startup with no, uh, you know, without some skill and training is a pretty painful experience. So, yes, sir. So what are your lessons learned from picking the partners? From picking? The partners. Like the the partners. Try not to get a boss that's an asshole. Um, <laughs> but I haven't been very successful at that. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, you just, especially if you're in a startup, you, you're all, I mean, it's like a marriage. I mean, you're all in the same boat, and you've got to see each other every day, and you all are going to succeed, or you're all going to fail. And so finding somebody who you really believe in, and you really trust is going to be able to get you to the line, is a good thing. I, I do not have a perfect record in doing that. You know, I, unfortunately, I'd like to say uh, that there is some magic, you know, you look for that glint in their eye or something, but you, you just want to find somebody that you personally, you know, feel some affinity to and can make, you know, have a good relationship with to, to make this happen because you're going to have to really go through thick and thin with this person. But it's, it, it's, it's just a chemistry thing. I mean, it's like love. You, you just have to meet this person and go, yeah, I could do this. But it, it's not easy. Yes, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on the regulation process. So, sure. Uh, for instance, a lot of uh, students here have uh, some experience with that in the sense that a lot of our research is sort of beholden to internal uh, uh, regulatory boards at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. uh, how does uh, FDA approval differ from that? Well, there's, there's two or three things. First of all, NIH funding NIH studies and FDA studies are different. They, they're both called football, but one's really soccer and one's really football. <laughs> so you think you're playing the same game, but you get out there and you're not wearing pads and boom, you're, you know, bad things happen. So um, that's a big difference. So if you're working with a PI who's only ever done NIH studies to write a paper and what he's going to have to do or she's going to have to do to do a clinical trial for FDA is going to be very different. The, the rules are different. Um, second, uh, in the FDA process, there's there's two parts of the play. The first part is you need an IDE, you need an investigational device exemption. So you have to whether you're going to do this, you know, unless you're you're going to do ten dogs or we'll just talk about human trials. We'll forget animal trials. Um, if you're going to do human trials and you've got to do more than just two or three kind of here inside the institution. But if you want to really do something where we need 10 patients from here and 10 from Boston and 10 from St. Louis, um, you have to do an investigational device exemption. So that's basically a license that lets you ship the device across state lines. If you want to do it all inside the state of Maryland, you don't need an IDE, but as soon as you want to cross the state line, and me as a startup, I, I don't want to just be trapped by being in Maryland or Colorado or wherever I am. The device exemption is specifically uh, to transport across state lines? Yes. It's, a, it's essentially a license. If you have a high-risk device, and I've only ever done high-risk devices, if you have a you know, nasal speculum or something like that, if you have a low-risk device, you don't need an IDE. But if you have a high-risk device, um, you have to go to the FDA and play Mother May I. So you have to show them, you have to submit this package of information. It's a very prescribed thing. But, you know, you have to show them you've done your basic science, it's safe, you've looked at all the possible adverse effects that could happen, you have a clinical trial plan, I know about how many patients, I've established what my clinical endpoint is going to be, you know, is the endpoint, I feel good about this, or is there, you know, I'm lowering blood sugar, I'm going to do a quality of life measurement, I'm going to survey the patient every week and see, you know, do you feel better about yourself, or, you know, whatever. And you'll get an IDE, so the FDA will approve your study after some fooling around. And then you have to go to the IRB here in Hopkins, or wherever you're going, 
and they have to approve it. So you're going to say, here, I've got this package, FDA has said it's okay, mother may I play, you know, here at Hopkins. Okay. Now by saying Hopkins, do you mean the home institution of the researchers or the, the institution where you plan to test the device? The institution where you plan to test the device has to approve it. So, you know, if you're going to go to Anne Arundel, they have their own IRB, and then you're going to go to University of Virginia, and they have their own, every hospital has their own IRB, or almost everyone. Um, and so you have to get the, the PI, you need a PI there, an investigator, and you need an IRB to approve it. Okay, now I've got permission to start. And then once I collect the data, then I'm, if I'm a, if I'm a medium, if I'm an incremental device, if I'm another MRI machine or another something, you'll use what's called the 510K path. So there you only have to prove that your device works as well as other devices on the market. So you have to pick a predicate. You say, my new nasal speculum is just as good as the one that Smith and Nephew is on the market with. And FDA will look at your data and Smith and Nephew's data and they'll say, yeah, okay. And then you get a 510K. It's a me too kind of a thing. If you have a weird device like focus ultrasound, um, you have to do a PMA, a pre-market approval. And so there, it's much more complicated, takes a lot more time, a lot more data, and FDA, you know, that's the, you know, this is a 510K, this is a PMA. Um, a friend of mine just submitted a PMA of 75,000 pages worth of the whole submission. I mean, it was like this tall. Um, 150 patients and 75,000 pages. So uh, it's a very, it's much more complex, and so a lot of times um, you, you have to decide up front what you're going to have, and so some companies will say, if the FDA will not agree to a 510K pathway, we're not going to do it. You know, it, it's just, I'm not going to go out and collect 75,000 pages worth of data. So, you, so first is getting the study approved, and second is getting the approval of the device for commercialization. It's, it's two separate processes. And there's no guarantee that once they approve the study, they, they say it right in big letters, sorry, I won't cut you off a number of times. Um, they say right at the end of the, that we will approve your study, we don't guarantee that this will be enough to get the study approved. Okay, the device question. question. Yeah. No, there's no upfront, if you do this, then we will approve it. If you do this, we may look at your data, and we may approve it, maybe. Okay, you can ultimately put together the 75,000 pages. And they look at it and say, yeah. <laughs> Yes, is that the reason why GE wasn't interested in keeping it within their company? Yeah, it would. It would. We would have been a PMA one, and Jack Welch did not want to be in therapy. He just sold the radiation therapy business and just said we don't want to be in therapy. He didn't want the medical liability. And do you think your startup would have been as successful if you didn't have this, I guess, kind of informal backing with GE or the networking that you had developed within? The um, well, from a technology, I mean, we had good access to GEMR, but no, GE didn't do much to help us. They didn't do anything to stop us, and they were helpful in terms of making, helping us with the interface of our device to them, but they were very arm's length. They were just, they were on the board, they didn't have any engineers inside of us. Uh, they didn't do anything to impede our progress, but like going to the FDA, you know, we used GE's name every time we could to make ourselves seem more important, you know. But um, otherwise, you're just a no-name company. So at least you could claim some. You could claim famous parents, you know. Um, so that helped a little bit. But no, they didn't do much to help us. Would have been nice. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions? All right. Uh, oh, yes, no. I'm sorry. Excuse sure. me. Like all the headaches you listed in the yep. presentation, I was wondering how the dynamics of the um, market work. So once you get to uh, selling and pass all these hurdles. It's a high barrier to entry, so it's fairly lucrative after you reach all these hurdles. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it can be sure. If you've got then, you know, then you're just down to sales and marketing, and you know, you know, I, and then you and competition. You know, somebody else comes along and they say, "Oh, wow, that looks great." You know, we would like to be in that market too. So, it's it. I mean, to take an idea. To to me, what really turns me on is to go to a hospital and try this on a real living, breathing patient and have somebody say, this is so fantastic. Thank you so much. You know, I have been suffering from this forever. I did not want to have a hysterectomy. I can't thank you much. And that is good for about another two years worth of suffering. That's, you know, Peter Black walked out. Peter Black was the chairman of neurosurgery. 
and I was, there was a bunch of people on a tour. I was taking some prospective customers when I was working with GE. Peter Black comes out of the OR and says, and, and he's you know all sweaty and you know pulls his mask down and he's just done this uh, craniotomy, and he just said, Rob, I just got to thank you and GE. I couldn't do what I do every day without you. And he just keeps walking. And the guy next to me says, is that Peter Black? I said, yes. He knows your name because Peter didn't talk to you. He didn't talk, especially vendors, he never talked to vendors. And I said, yeah. And the guy said, he must like it. But that's where you can see you make a difference. So I've never been interested in, you know, perfecting the ballpoint pen or, you know, coming up with a new color for iPads or something. You know, it's a, it's a pretty amazing world to work in where you can really change medicine and change people's lives. So it's worth it. Any other questions? I'll hang around for a while, and they've got my email. I'd be glad to you know, send me a question, or I'm sure I'll see you in some of these design reviews. And uh, actually, before you leave, we have some uh, evaluation forms. If you could just take uh, a minute or two just to let us know what you thought. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark.